All right. So here we go again. Our second day in our new paradigm, which is the concurrency paradigm. Now, um, so we'll start off. Any questions about the homework? Were you able to get some interleavings to make that thing, the final value, be 10? Did you have a question? Yeah. And so the question was, how, how do you enumerate the number of possible interleavings? And I, can you... Uh, I it was, it was four for both sides. Four for both sides? Okay, so there was P1, P2, P3, P4, and then... For Q, there must have been Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Yeah, and so, yeah, it, it was, you have to kind of like count them up systematically. And you, you got a final number. And the main thing is you just, I think the, the, thing, the way to do it systematically is first do all of these first and then all of these second. So you'd have P1, P2, P3, P4, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And then just try to do systematically see how you can... S how you can switch them, but now you can't. The thing you can't do is you can't you can't have you can't have any of these execute out of order, and you can't have any of these execute out of order. But you can have them be interleaved in any order that you want. Well, I mean, I think if you there are a lot. There are a lot. Did, did you get actually? Did you actually get a final number? Was it in the tens or hundreds? It was less than a hundred. Okay. Well, I think there's going to be a, a question uh, later that talks about if there are n of these and m of these. Or maybe, maybe it's if there's n of both of them. We'll, 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 we will ruminate about that. Yeah, see, we'll, we will generalize that for this. And there is a simple expression that... Yeah, actually... Well, well, you could either read ahead. Well, no, I think it's an exercise. I don't think it's in the book. I mean, I think it's an ex I think it's going to be a future exercise. Well, in general. But I mean, uh, do, were you able to do it without enumerating every single one? I mean, could you? How did you figure out what the number was? Oh, you did write them all out. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that was kind of a brute force way to do it. But yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Any more questions? But you were able to see the pattern. I think so. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if it was correct, but I did do it a different way. So. How, what was your approach? Um, I did it kind of like with um, counting like the so like oh, but now permutations, you got to be careful yeah, if you're going to, you, you got to be careful of yeah. that you can't, you can't switch the yeah, order. I accounted for that. Oh, you, and you accounted for that. Okay, that's a good counting exercise. Uh huh. I found the pattern, like the, if there were N cases. Oh, you did. Uh, you did it. By doing one, two, and three, then you generalize and found it for, for, and then you did it for one, two, and three, and you saw that what the expression was, and then you extrapolated and you plugged it in for four. Oh, that's interesting. That's a good way to approach these kinds of problems. Yeah, good deal. Well, I see we have lots of different approaches here. That's good. This was a nice discussion. And um, now the other thing was to get um, Baki. We haven't. We didn't really actually talk about what that is. This um, B A C I. What I asked you to do was to get this set up on your computer. And we're actually doing things a little bit differently this year compared to what we usually do. Um, does anybody know what Baki stands for, B-A-C-I? This is, do you know the author of our, fir of our book, our first book, Ben-Ari? Okay, so this is the Ben-Ari Concurrency in uh, Interpreter. So he wrote, or he, you know, he, he designed this language for teaching concurrency principles. And uh, he and there's a Java implementation of the of Baki, the Binari concurrency interpreter. And what we have done, here, here's what we're doing new this year though. In past years, we had you set it up, set up their software. But it's interesting. Um, this year, for the very first time, we're going to use, we have written, actually, I say we, it's actually Ashley Broadwell. 
you know who Ashley is. And then and she has been working with me on writing a plugin for NetBeans. And we've taken all this code and we've incorporated it into our plugin and it makes the installation so much easier. So um, we're not actually going to use this for a few more, it's going to be a few more sessions before we actually use this. And it's not so important that you know how to do, that you learn how to do this because under the old way you had to go through and you'd set all your path variables and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do any of that anymore. All you have to do is just install the plugin for NetBeans and it should work. But um, you said you were having problems with that, though. The plug-in thing, you followed the plug-in directions. I'll work with you uh, uh, individually on that if you're having problems. Did anybody else get the plug-in to work? To install? You got it to install OK? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, I think you said to test it with some... Uh, with a C minus minus? Yeah, and then you, the question is, what code do you test it with? Yeah, I wasn't sure. Yeah, you know what you can do? You could just to make sure... It's, it's a subset of C++. You can just do this. You can just do C out... You can just do C out, hello world, hello world, you know, exclamation, you know, bash in, whatever, quote. You can just test it with that. Just put it in the, the main. Yeah, it gives you, you know, when you install that plugin, it gives you, uh, when you do a new project, it gives you a little code, it gives you the, um, a .cm file yeah. all ready for you to plug in. And, it's, and it gives you the, the opening brace and the close brace and the thing. And you can just put this in here. Yeah. And I think if you run this, Hello World should come out. Yeah, it did. Yeah, good. So it's installed. Yeah. Okay. So I've given the, so this is the first time we've, we've, we've you know, we only just got this thing up and running just a few weeks ago. So, but it should be a whole lot easier to, and now we have this bit, now we, you can use the NetBeans editor, you know, so before we would have to do like we do, we're doing a gprolog, you know, have a separate editor and do it on the command line, and so now it's all NetBeans plugin. So this should be more convenient this, this time. Okay, now what I want to do this, what we're going to do today is, <clears throat> there's a lot of little details here of what we're going to do today, and, um, but it's the idea we had today's today's lecture is is completely it's it's all conceptual okay so we got to get the concept we got to get this concept down before we go any further because um, everything that we do from now on when we analyze concurrent uh, processes concurrent programming is it's all based on certain assumptions and what we need to do today is we need to look at these assumptions and what's going on in the real world and how we model the real world and so it's all conceptual so I want you to think really hard about this all these slides are online oh by the way here I corrected now it says a multi-programming system so let's review right away let's start off by reviewing what's the difference between a multi-programming and a multi-processing system with a multi-programming system there's only one processor and here's the example of how these jobs can be executed with arbitrary interminglings, interleavings, because we don't know when the interrupts are, but there's only one processor. And we con contrast that with a multi what? Processing system. Now, I'll, so let's take it, let's review this picture, figure 8.20 from the computer systems book. Check it out. Now, and here's what I want us to notice here. You guys, look. Here we have CPU 1, and here we have CPU 2. So here we have two processors, right? So these could be two cores on a chip in your laptop. Are you with me? And yet you only have one main memory. Are you with me? Is everybody visually get, got that visual? two processors but they are sharing the same main memory. Now tell me you guys, now those of you who have had computer systems and you recognize this, these kind of pictures, these block diagrams, tell me where are the values of the variables stored? Do you remember the C++ memory model? Okay here's a really quick 
review of the C++ memory model. Do you remember the C++ memory model? Those of you, now not all of you have had computer, who's, who's had computer systems? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, not very many. Okay, do you remember the C++ memory model? There were three parts, there were three parts to it. Do you remember? Uh-oh, pressure's on. Dun, dun, da, 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 da. You don't remember what the three parts of the, no, okay, you confess. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you the first one. Where are global variables stored? Now do you remember? No. The global variables are stored where? No. <laughs> Two out of three. Still not. Global variables are stored in a fixed location in memory. Remember that? And now what, what about local variables and parameters? Where are they stored? On the what? On the runtime stack. And then dynamically allocated variables are, are stored where? They're on the, allocated on the heap. Good. So you did. So do you do remember this now, right? Now the rest of you guys, are, you, did you get what we, you know that everybody here knows C++. You know what global variables are. You know what local variables are. And you know what dynamically allocated variables are. So here's the thing. <coughs> All those variables, the heap is in main memory. The runtime stack is in main memory. And global variables are stored in main memory. Are you with me? That's where their values are stored. They're all stored in main memory. Are you with me? But now where does the arithmetic, where does, where does, where does the um, arithmetic and assignment statements take place? You know, what does the actual compute, what, what processes the information? The central processing unit does the processing. So the, the, the scenario is, it has to get the stuff from main memory and go into the CPU and do the processing and then go, from there go back to the main memory. Now, even those of you who have not had computer systems, did you get that scenario? Are you with me? Imagine that the values of the variables are in main memory and the processing takes place in the CPU. So do you see if there's more than one CPU, there's still only one main memory. Now that's going to be important in the discussion to follow. Is everybody clear? Are we good? Okay. And then, just again by way of review, oh, and here's what we're going to want to explain today. Do you remember the concurrency theorem? It's, what is the concurrency theorem? It says that multi-programming and multi-processing are logically equivalent. Now, we just stated that. We didn't say why. We didn't demonstrate why this is the case. What I want here, our whole job today, part of our whole part of our job today, a big part of our job today, is to understand why multiprogramming and multiprocessing are logically are logically equivalent when you actually look at the hardware and the operating system. Are you with me? See, these issues are, are intimately connected to the hardware and the operating system. It's kind of it's kind of more than any other topic, to understand concurrency, you really kind of have to understand the implementation details. It's hard to abstract this stuff away from, I mean, if you really want to kind of like understand what's going on. Do you see what I mean? It's, the, the, the issues are all tied to operating system software and they're also tied to the hardware. So the concurrency theorem, multiprogramming and multiprocessing are logically equivalent. All right, now, Let's go to the next chapter to continue our discussion of this most important topic. So, last time we talked about these interleavings and here, was the, here are the six possible interleavings for when there's two each. Okay, and we, we looked at this trivial concurrent program <coughs> And we said, what were the possible final values of n with this algorithm 2.1? You remember? Can you tell? Just can you analyze this really quickly? Yeah, depending on whether this go on whether we do p1 q1 or what q1 p1. So if you do p1 q1, what is it? Yeah. Whereas if you do q1 p1, yeah. Is everybody clear? So 
with the possible final values of n. We can and and we said we could analyze it with a state transition diagram. So what was a state transition diagram? Well, we looked at this state transition diagram for a sequential, and then we looked at this state transition diagram for a concurrent. And what happens is because in the state transition diagram, what it contains is the statement that's going to execute next. But if there's more than one, if it's, if it's running concurrently, we don't know if P1 is going to execute next or Q1 is going to execute next. So we take a branch in the state transition diagram, depending on which one's going to execute next. And then this was your homework problem. To devise an interleaving such that in algorithm 2.9, it terminates with a value of 10. Do we able to get this one okay? No, you can't, couldn't figure out how, how, how to do that one? Okay, okay, look. Okay, look. This P1, when it says do 10 times, just imagine this is 4 int i gets 0, i less than 10, i plus plus. Just imagine that that's what that do 10 times means. So, it's, so, it, so what's going to happen is it's going to do, this, is, this P is going to execute the following statements. P1, P2, P3. Wait, let me do it again. P1, P2, P3. 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 Then P1, P2, P3. And then P1 for the last test. And then that's it. That's going to be the sequence of, of, for this one. Well, wait, say that again. Ask your question again. What happens if it does what? Exactly. And, and furthermore, that's, yeah, it could. And that's how you solve the, it has to do that in order for you to solve the problem. So what repeats, like, how does it repeat then? It goes, oh, I see. Well, conceptually, what, they could have, look, these jobs, these jobs are running, are, if it is a multi-programming system, they can be interle. then there's only one processor. That's the easiest way to think of it. There's only one processor, and they can be interleaved in any arbitrary order. And this question is asking you, in what order sh could they be interleaved in such a way as to have the final value of n be 10 instead of 20? So, what's your question? No, 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 but wait, wait, wait. When it, it does 10 times, it doesn't do the whole thing in 10 times. It does, look, it doesn't do the whole thing 10 times. No, but if it cuts from P1 to Q1, yeah. how does the process go? It, here's what it does. It, it, yes, it does. It can do that. That's the point. Look, and let's, let's think about how it does it. Let's think about how it does it. It's, it's as if it's as if that P1 do 10 times. It's as if P is it's as if P1 is is 4 int i gets 0. Um, is that semicolon or semicolon or con, semi, i i less i gets 0. I is less than 10. I plus plus. And then boom. It's like this. Are you with me? Yeah. So this is P1, all right? Now the first time P1, the first time P1 executes, it does int i gets zero and it tests for i less than ten. Are you with me? And then let's suppose that it does P2. So then P2 would execute. And now, and now suppose there's an interrupt. Then what would happen? Q1 would do for int, now let's suppose that the Q1, so here's the P1 and here's the P2, and here's the P3, and now here's, and now suppose we have a Q1, suppose we write down Q1, Q2, and Q3 here, okay, and now what'll happen, but Q1 is really equivalent to what? It's really equivalent to for int, it's for int j, gets zero, uh, 
j is less than 10, uh, j plus plus, right? And then it's q2 and it's q3. So now what I'm saying, what, are, are you having a hard time visualizing if this executes and then this executes and then this executes and then this executes, there's nothing to prevent this from going back and then having p3 execute. Yes, it does stop in the middle of the loop. Does P3 have to have the tensile time? P3 has to happen. Yes, P3 has to happen 10 times. Oh, this is a new this is a puzzle, isn't it? P3 does have to happen. Yeah. 10 times. Every one of these has to happen 10 times. Well, actually this one has P1 has to happen 11 times because one time for the final test. And P2 has to happen 10 times, and P3 has to happen 10 times. How could it, are you, ask, are you curious how it could ever be not 10, less than 20? Oh, it, but it is. Because look what, because look. You want me to give you a little hint? <laughs> because look, when you do temp gets n, and then n gets temp plus 1, when you do temp gets n, Suppose it's interrupted after the P2. Then what would this guy do? This guy would get its what? Temp gets N. Now, do you understand that, hold on, we, there's one thing that we have to be very careful about here. This temp is the temp inside P. It is not the same thing as this temp inside Q. These are two different temps. I, in fact, I wish our author had not called them both temp. On the other hand, this n is this global n, and that is the same thing as the n in Q. Are you with me? So, are you with me that these two temps are different temps? Yeah? So look, the clue is that P2, there's going to be an interruption. It's going to be P1 and then P2, and then and then after P, after P, P, P2 does this, temp gets in. Here, actually, I'll show you what. Let's do it. I, I'll tell you what let's do. Can we focus over here? Watch this. Let's do, let's do this. Let's do, let's do P1. Let's suppose we have a program that does this. P1 uh, temp gets in P2 uh, n gets n plus 1 and then over here let's have q1 be temp gets n and q2 be uh, n gets n plus 1. Oh sorry, not n plus 1. n gets, uh, what is it, temp plus 1? This is temp gets n, n gets, n gets temp plus 1. And here is Q2, uh, temp gets N, uh, N gets temp plus 1. Okay, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the phenomenon that will help you do this. And at the beginning, we're going to think, so, so temp is local here, and the global here is going to be N initialized to 0. Now tell me, if you do P1, P2, are, are you with me? Then what will, that ha what will happen to N? And then after that, you do Q1, Q2, what will N be? N will be 2, right? Are you with me? So what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, here's, here's the scenario. P1, P2, Q1, Q2. If you do it this order, the final value of N is what? Final value of N is 2. Are we, are we good? Everybody, are you with me? What happens if we do this? P1, Q1, P2, Q2. Now, now you an, let's analyze this very carefully and see what happens. Can you, can, you, can you tell me what is the final value of N? In this case, what is the final value of N is what? Because look, what, what's going to happen here? If you do P1, what's P1 going to get? Sorry, when you do P1, what's the, what, what is its temp going to get? Zero. It's going to get zero. Then, if we do Q1, what's going to happen? Its temp, temp is going to get what? 
0. Then if you do n gets 0 plus 1, what does n get? And then if you do n gets 0 plus 1, what are you going to get? So what's the final value of n? Ha ha! It's not 2. So, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, you thought the temps were the same. No wonder. Yeah, see, I prefaced, yeah. Unfortunate use of the word temp, the same, yeah. That's a local temp, and those temps are different. And that's a little confusing. I wish he had named them differently. To Oh, you mean even if they were sharing temp? Yeah. Uh, well, well, I would have to think about it. Yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess that's a good point. So his point was that even if temp were a shared global variable, you would still have the same, re, you, the analysis would prove that it would be, we, would be the same thing here. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. It's also, which is, makes it doubly unfortunate that he used the same word temp for two different variables. Because you could analyze it and say, oh, see? Yeah, yeah, unfortunate. But, yeah, or, yeah, and to be consistent, it should have been like temp P and temp Q, you know? Oh, temp. <laughs> I meant temp. <laughs> oh, well. I think we beat this horse to death. Is it, but now, do you see how? Do you see? Do you see how? Do you see how we? What's going on here? How to? How to figure out how to make it? Yeah. All right. Okay. Now what? We, now, now, now comes the the crucial conceptual part of what we want to understand. First of all, the compiler. Now here again, those of you who have had computer systems, and know. Um, and know what the computer does. Do you remember? Well, first of all, what does a compiler do? The compiler translates a single statement of a high order language to multiple machine language statements. So here in C or Java, if you see this statement, n gets k plus 1. Now, do you guys in computer systems remember how that gets translated in assembly language? Do you remember the assembly language for this? We did this a bazillion times in computer systems. Do you remember? Yeah, there's accumulator. So what would you do to the accumulator? Load. You would load the accumulator. Direct. Oh, excellent memory. You would load the accumulator with the value of k using direct addressing. And then what would you do? Oh, come on. Add accumulator, Add accumulator what? One. One, immediate addressing. And then do what? store accumulator N into n using direct addressing oh boy okay so here it is here's the using this this is what we learned in computer systems right do you guys remember that okay, now for those of you who didn't that did not have computer systems that's all right you can imagine what happens remember we showed in the slide before there was a memory and a cpu so does everybody see that what this load accumulator k oh this was stack relative addressing. I, I assume this k was a, a local variable instead of a global variable, right? But anyway, are we good? And then this is add one immediate addressing. And oh, actually, we were assuming this is assuming that k is a local variable and n is a global variable. So n is stored using direct addressing. So everybody, okay? I mean, those of you who are in computer systems. Well, you'll learn, all, you'll learn all these details when you get to computer systems. But look, do you remember the picture that we had before? It had a CPU and memory. Now, I want everybody to understand. When you do load this, this K, where is the value of that variable stored? Which part? Is it stored in the CPU or is it stored in main memory? Where are the, what was the C++ memory model? We just reviewed that. It's main memory. So does everybody see that this load accumulator takes it from memory to the CPU, to the processing unit? Are you with me? And then where does this addition take place? Where does the actual addition take place? 
in the central processing unit because that's some processing. That's an addition, which is processing. And then when you do n gets that, what is it, where does it go from where to where? What's the, it goes from where to where? From the CPU back to the memory, only this time it goes back to the memory location for n. Is everybody with me on that? Now does everybody, do you guys, even if you didn't have computer systems, does everybody see the picture of where those are going? According to that picture that we had before? Okay. Are we good? Now, here is a fact that is uh, kind of unfortunate for us. In practice, the interleaving takes place at the machine level, not at the high order language level. So you understand that when you write a program, and you have to know this, when you write a program and you write it in C++, that gets translated, one C++ statement gets translated to a bunch of, of low, you know, machine language statements. And the interleaving that takes place in practice is at that, it's, it's those interleavings. It's interleaving those individual instructions, those individual machine language instructions. That's where the interleaving is happening. Because it doesn't execute C++ statements, it executes machine language statements. So it translates and then those machine language statements are the ones that are getting interleaved. Are you with me? Does everybody see how that works? What's happening? To do the analysis correctly, you must analyze algorithm 2.1 as follows. Now here is that assembly language that we learn in computer systems. For those of you who didn't have computer systems, you should be able to get the idea anyway. So look, here is, so when we say integer, n gets zero, and then in p, for, for statement p, we had integer k1 gets one, and for q, we had integer k2 gets two, right? So look what this, look at what actually happens. Even though we write k1 gets one, what happens, what, what happens at the assembly language or machine language level? This is not just one statement, how many statements is it? How many statements is this one assignment statement? Not one, but what? Two. And so how does this thing, how does this work? When we do K1 gets one, what do we do? It loads the accumulator with K1. Okay. So, so what the assembly language, the assembly language translation of that is, it sends K1 to the CPU, that's what the load does, and then, it, and then store goes from the CPU to N. Are you, are you with me here? And then, and then this, K, this uh, N gets K2, this N gets K2 is load accumulator K2 and then store accumulator to N. Now, does everybody see what's going on physically? The fact that there's a CPU and memory and it's going from one place to the other. It's going from the memory to the CPU with the load and from the CPU to the memory with the store. LDA stands for load accumulator and STA stands for store accumulator. Now, we said all that to say this. What was the concurrency theorem? What's it logically equivalent? Multiprocessing and multiprogramming. Now watch this. Suppose in a multiprocessing system one CPU tries to execute store accumulator N. At the same time, another CPU tries to execute store accumulator N. Do you see what I mean? So look, the picture that we have, well, there's some pictures coming up in the later slides. So the picture that we have is that there's more than, here, here's the way our author puts it. This, this, is like this local memory here. This is like what's in the CPU, in one CPU. This local memory is like what's in another CPU. And they're both trying to put it from the CPU into memory at the same time. Now what value is, what value do we have here on this one, this on the left CPU? It's zero, zero, it's one. And then what value do we have here in binary? One, zero, right? And what he's illustrating here, he says, he, he's, he's saying, he, what he's saying with the slide is he's saying, he's saying, so what would happen if they both tried to do it at exactly the same time? And what, the scenario here is what happened? It kind of like, here was a one, here was a one, zero, and what happened here? It was like a, 
one one. It's kind of like they got mixed in together, right? I'm here to tell you, or he's here to tell you, we are here to tell you, this is not what happens. Yeah, it is good. Because what do the hardware engineers, when, this hard, when these hardware designers design these uh, CPUs that are running at the same time, and if they both try to put two different things in the same location at once, guess what those, those, those clever hardware engineers, guess what they did? They designed circuitry to make sure that if they try to go there in there at the exact same time, that they would have an arbitrator circuit that would choose one over the other so that this mangling of the information can never happen. And so in effect, it would, if they try to, to do it at the same time, it would force one to go first and then the other. Now are you with me on that? That's the crucial, that's the crucial issue. It would force one to happen before. So do you know what, do you realize what this means? This means that the interleaving, you can think of it as the two possibilities as first one happening and then the other one. Even though they're both executing at the same time, if they try to write to the same location, one of them is going to be forced to go, go first. You see? Did, is, do you see what's going on there? Okay, so that's the, here, so let's go back here. So the hardware will force one to go first, so the corruption in the next slide will not occur. So this corruption will never occur, and here's our conclusion. The effect is the same as if an arbitrary interleaving happens in a multi-programming system. Because in a multi-programming system, you're just switching from one to the other to the other. You see what I mean? Well, so if the only place where they can interact is if they're trying to access the same memory at the same time, what difference does it make if they're, if, you know, if they're both executing at the same time? When it really counts, one of them is going to go first. Are you with me? And that is the hardware reason why the justification of the concurrency theorem. So you see, you can, we can just think from now on, it's easier to think of it as multi-programming, right? Isn't that an easier picture, mental picture? Oh, you interleave, 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 right? And you, you, like you said yesterday or last time, I fail to see the concurrency in this. Well, yeah, there is no concurrency. The concurrency was apparent. But now that we see how, what would happen if there were multi-processors, processors, it's logically the same problem. It's a problem of how do you inter of all the possible interleavings that you don't know. Is everybody with me on that? Okay, so now, so that's, that is the physical, uh, that's the physical issue, the physical thing that, that, that it's, like, it's, it's like it forces them to be interleaved, right? The hardware forces it to be interleaved and not to be ever mangled. Okay, so now let's talk about the, what it means to be an atomic statement. Because what we're going to do now is we're going, to tr we're going to justify one of the assumptions that is, ma that is made in our textbook, in, our, in Benari's uh, textbook here, the atomic assumption, and we're going, to justify, we're going to justify it. Even though we know things are more complicated than what they may appear to be, we're going to justify it. So check this out. First of all, we have to understand what, what does it mean by, what does the phrase atomic statement mean? What is an atomic statement? And here it is. What is an atomic statement? When we say this statement is atomic, what do we mean? What, what were atoms actually? <laughs> do you remember chemistry? There were molecules and then a whole bunch of molecules made up. Or sorry, a whole, yeah, a whole bunch of atoms is how you construct a molecule, right? So supposedly in the early day, in the very early days of chemistry, what was an atom? It was an atom, it was a something that could not be further subdivided. Of course, we know now that we can subdivide them into electrons and protons and neutrons, and uh, but atomic means indivisible. Are you with me? So a statement is atomic if it cannot be interleaved at a lower level of abstraction. And here is what Benari's assumption is. All statements in the algorithms of Benari's text are assumed to be atomic. Do you see a problem with that statement? Well, 
yeah, what, yeah, what about a statement like this? What about a statement like N gets temp? What about a statement like N gets temp plus 1? What about this statement? We are going to assume that this is atomic. And what's the pro yeah, now, now, now what, 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 what do you say? Hmm? Yeah, this can be interleaved at a lower level of abstraction. In fact, it, so how in the world are we going to, how can we, how can we, how can we make this claim when we know that the reality is different? What's going to, what's our justification for this? Because we're going to be analyzing algorithms as, and each one we want, we want to be able to say, we're going to assume that this one is atomic. Every assignment statement is atomic. But we know assignment statements are not atomic. So how can we make this assumption? No. No, it doesn't have anything to do with hardware. I mean, you can't, there's no getting around the fact that this is not really, in real life, is not atomic. You know, we're getting around that. So look, here's the thing. What we're going to do is we are going to simulate, we are going to simulate the register in the CPU with statements that we assume will be atomic. And that will actually be equivalent to, that will actually be equivalent to the fact that this does, can be interleaved. Well, that was not a very good explanation, but anyway, let's see if we can understand this. So here's our justification of the atomic assumption. It can make a difference in the analysis if you make the atomic assumption. So check this out. The following scenarios for algorithm 2.3 makes the atomic assumption for the assignment statement. Okay? So look, let's go to algorithm let's let's go to algorithm 2.3 and see what algorithm 2.3 says. Now, what does algorithm 2.3 say? It says P1 and gets n plus 1, Q1 and gets n plus 1, right? So now, so now tell me, suppose we do, so here's algorithm 2.3, 2.3. So now tell me, if we do P1 comma Q1, then what's the final value, what's the final value, final value of uh, n is 2. On the other hand, if we do q1 followed by p1, what's the final value of n? It's 2. Assuming that they are atomic. Right? Is everybody with me on that? If we use the atomic assumption, then that's it. That's it. But what do we know could happen in real life? What do we know could happen in real life? What, what we just analyzed that. What could happen? We could do, we could load. See, how would we do this n plus, how, do, how, do, how, would, how would we do this, this n plus 1? How would, we, how would we do n gets n plus 1? We would do what? We would we'd load the value of n into the accumulator, add 1 to it, and then store it. But what if we loaded the value of the accumulator of this, and that loaded the, that, loaded that, and then suppose we, over here, we loaded the, the, this one then that would also load what? Zero into, the, into its accumulator. But then if you add one, that would make it what? One. And then if you store that there, that would be one. And then if you add one here, that would be one. And then you store it, and that would make one. So the final value would be what? The va fi final value wouldn't be two. What would it be? It could be one. So, here, but so, so, how, so how can we justify this? See? So, he, so here, is, here is the scenario for atomic assignment statements, right? So here's, if P1 happens first and then Q1 happens, the final value is 2. If Q1 happens and then P1 happens, the final value is 2, right? But look, so, so the following scenarios for algorithm 2.3 do not make the atomic assumption, right? So here, so here is what I just said verbally. Here it is laid out in the slide. So here what's he doing? He's doing a load, add, and store. So here is, 
here is a load, load, so P1 is a load, P2 is add, P3 is store, Q1 is load, Q2 is add, Q2 is store, all right? So then he's showing, he's showing an example here of where you could load the zero into one of the registers and then, and then add it and then add one to it and then store it here, right? And then, and, that, and that's how each statement is, is uh, translated into three separate statements. And now he's giving a scenario for how the final value could be one. So look, so what, what happens, so check this out. Here's process P, here's process Q. And now instead of just being P and Q, it's P1, P2, P3, and Q1, Q2, Q3. So what happens if P1 executes first? Then the register, P's register, gets zero. And then, and then if he, and then if he adds, um, oh, and then, and then if you load, and then if the other one loads, and so that one gets zero. And then if you add one to the first one, that gets one. And then you, if you add one to the second one, that gets one. And then if you store, store that one, it's one. And if you store the other one, it's one. So, so this is a scenario when it's one. So the question, but here, we haven't solved anything. This is just illustrating what we said before. They're different. So how is it that we can assume that? Well, here's how we're going to do it. Look. Here is the solution to all of this yakking. <laughs> or here's the conclusion to all of this yakking. Even though the results are different, depending on whether we make the atomic assumption, we can still model the non-atomic assumption with atomic assignment statements, and the way we do it is with the temp. So look, do you see then that when we did algorithm 2.4, when we did algorithm 2.4, really when we said temp gets n, n gets temp plus 1. Do you see that this temp gets n really corresponds to what? To, well, just this, just the temp gets n, that corresponds to what? To the load. Are you with me? And then this, n gets temp plus 1, corresponds to the store. See? Is everybody, you see what I mean? And, the, and this is like the load, and this is like the store. So what happens is, the same, what we do is, if we, model our, if we model our computation in a way that mirrors the fact that these could be, inter, that, that the original ones could be interleaved, then we are, anal, then it's a reflection of that interleaving that would take place at a lower level. But now we can assume that this is atomic. Because we have modeled our computation to mimic what goes on with a compiler. Now, that was, this is a, a tricky concept to get, but are you with me on this? Does everybody see what's going on? So that's why we're using these temps here. The reason we're using these temps is because it, it's, it simulates it simulates what goes on with the loads and the stores at the lower level of abstraction, you know, at the machine level or the assembly language level. You see? So that's why, that's the rationale. The rationale, the reason we can use the atomic assignment, the, the atomic assumption for every statement in these high level languages is because we are using these temps to mirror or to simulate what would happen if we, if we didn't use the temps, but they had to ge get translated to loads and stores. Now, all of that has a lot to do with the hardware and the software and the inter interleaving and all that stuff, but does everybody see the idea? This was a conceptual, this, all these ideas are all conceptual, but it's important that we have a good conceptual understanding of what we're doing here and why we can make the atomic assumption. Are we good? Is everybody, is everybody with me on that? Okay, so, um, yeah, so here's the, so here, here, here is the P1, P2, and here's the correct scenario for assignment statements, and then the other one is, see, here's where you, you do the, the temp gets in, and then the temp gets in, the n gets temp plus one, the n gets temp plus one, and it winds up with the final value of one. 
But you see this mirrors, this figure, it's slide 2.16, is an exact mirror of what? Of slide 2.20. This one where it has the load, load, add, add, store, store. And you end up with the final value of one. Is everybody, is everybody with me on that? Okay. So we can make that assumption because he's structured his programs in a way that allows it to be true. Basically. Yes, we can make, that's a good way of putting it. We can make that assumption because the algorithms that we are going to study are going to be structured with these temp variables in such a way as to, as to simulate all the negative effects that could happen if the interleaving happened at a lower level of abstraction. And as a matter of fact, we are going to see a little bit more mathematically, we're going to see how we can prove that um, they can be considered atomic. There's going to be certain conditions under which we, are, we, we will be able to analyze the fact that we can treat these as being atomic. We're going to make this, I guess what I'm saying is, we're going to make this more mathematically precise later on. But I want to do, but for right now, that, this is the concept. All right, is everybody good with this? I think this is really important. This is a different, this is a paradigm shift. This is a different way of thinking with concurrency. Good deal. Okay, see you next time.